Uh, we will uh, spend the maximum amount of time gathering your advice, input, comments, and experiences on obtaining and receiving health care in Vermont. We go to the next slide, please, Gretchen. This is what we're uh, about. Act 167 passed by the legislature in 2022 requires the Green Mountain Care Board in collaboration with the Agency for Human Services to conduct a data informed, patient focused, community inclusive engagement process aimed at helping Vermont's hospitals to reduce inefficiency, lower costs or reduce the rate of cost growth, improve population health outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential services. Green Mountain Care Board has asked Oliver Wyman, the group that, uh, and my team, uh, to uh, lead that effort. So what we are doing is we are conducting listening sessions to obtain uh, the firsthand experiences of Vermont uh, re residents and citizens about navigating uh, the healthcare system in Vermont. What went well, what didn't, why, what you would like to see more of, and what you uh, think the healthcare system in Vermont should look like in the next five to 10 years. We're doing this by conducting community meetings, both with the broader community, such as, uh, as yourselves, uh, but also with a variety of specific groups, including those who provide healthcare in Vermont, broadly uh, stated, physicians, nurses, emergency medicine technicians, advanced practice nurses, and uh, uh, physician assistants, nursing home, uh, uh, people, uh, home health folk, mental health people, and so forth. We're doing this this fall through multiple meetings, all conducted virtually like this one to enable the maximum number of people to attend. And we will then uh, formulate a series of options to, uh, to uh, assist the hospitals and hopefully improve health care. Those will be uh, subjected to intense analysis over the winter. And following that, we'll take your comments again, relook at uh, those an analysis, uh, analyzed options, reformulate them if necessary, and then uh, come up to the community in person next uh, late winter and uh, have a meeting with the hospital board and leadership to go through what those recommendations might be, discuss the pros and cons, get their input, and then subsequently have an in-person uh, community meeting, and in this part of Massachusetts, a town meeting, uh, to again, review what the options might be and get your observations uh, and advice. We'll then go back, relook at those options, and prepare a final report, which would go to the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and to the state legislature. Next slide. This is the team. Uh, my name is Bruce Hamry. I'm a physician. I've been in uh, medicine in one way or another for a little over 50 years, uh, both in academic medicine and group practice. Um, and uh, over the last 10 years as the uh, a partner and the chief medical officer for Oliver Wyman's uh, health and life science practice. One of my colleagues in this is Ms. Elizabeth Sutherland, who is uh, working with us in the area of health equity. Ms. Terry, I'll get to you when we're finished these slides. I wanna get through them quickly so we can uh, then get to comments. Ms. Sutherland uh, and I have worked together for 10 years. She recently moved to a different consulting group, but she's leading the efforts in health equity and diversity. Mr. Sam Winters, our engagement manager. 
Dr. Chidera Chuleki, uh, one of our consultants. Uh, he's a neuropharmacologist with an expertise in tobacco and alcohol dependency, and has spent the last several years with us working primarily in the area of government payers, Medicare and Medicaid. And Ms. Gretchel Gonzalez is uh, staffing this, doing a lot of the day-to-day -day work, including uh, this meeting. Next slide, please. This is what we're trying to do. I will keep the, this introduction and context uh, setting as brief as possible. Uh, we do want to spend the maximum amount of time getting your uh, experience, your opinions on what should be improved and, if possible, how to do that, and what the ideal healthcare system in Vermont should look like. At the end, we'll provide you an additional uh, way or two to continue to inform us uh, of the, your experience and uh, uh, wishes. Next slide. Vermont has been very successful at getting people insured. Only 3.1% of people living in Vermont were uninsured last uh, two years ago with cost being the reason most, uh, most of those folks didn't have it. And that compares favorably to 8.6% of the US population being uninsured. However, despite that the success, 40% of people in Vermont under age 65 are underinsured, that is unable to afford the out-of-pocket health expenses with uh, for uh, deductibles, co-pays, prescription drugs, and over-the-counter drugs. Next slide, Gretchen. This shows the math. In 2020, the median family income in Vermont for a family of four was a little over $67,000. After deducting federal and state income tax, that family would bring home about $43,000. If you look below to the left, if the family and their employer could afford the, uh, the premiums for one of the uh, platinum plans from a large, uh, one of the large insurance companies in Vermont, the total uh, premiums for that would be almost $40,000. If you look to the right, even with that uh, premium plan that would have the lowest deductible and copay, the uh, family would still be subject to almost $5,000 yearly in out-of-pocket medical costs if someone were ill. So almost $5,000 out of a take-home uh, budget of $43,000. So clearly unaffordable and a reason that many people either delay seeking medical care or avoid it altogether. Next slide. This shows the wait times for obtaining specialty services uh, at various hospitals uh, in the state. The data is about 18 months old. Things have not improved, and certainly then and now, we've heard stories of people waiting six, 12 months or longer to receive needed uh, medical care. Again, not acceptable. Next slide. So, here we are. Uh, one, this is this is it, and then we'll get to your uh, comments and experiences. So, a couple of quick housekeeping things. Please stay on mute when you're not speaking. Use the raise your hands uh, feature found under reactions at the bottom of the screen uh, to raise the raise your hand. We'll certainly call you in order. We will pause every few minutes. Uh, to allow folks on the phone to make comments. Please feel free to include questions on the chat uh, and we will, uh, we will take note of those as well. Let me note, um, as I should have at the start, that we are recording this session. The purpose of that is to allow us to accurately capture the comments that you make we do have some members of the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency for Human Services listening in. 
we may have some legislators in the state. If there are, I would ask that you please identify yourself and make any comments now you wish to make. Thank you. Please, Ms. Franson. Good afternoon, I'm Vivian. I'm living uh, here in Braintree, which is about four miles from downtown Randolph and about five miles from Gifford Medical Center. I am 67 years old. My husband turns 68 next month. We both have Medicare. Uh, we both buy supplemental health insurance and we both have a, a, a pharmacy plan. Hmm. What we don't have is a primary care provider. Yeah. And, um, you know, when we moved here to Vermont last January, I had a hunch we were going to have a hard time finding a primary care provider. Mm -hmm. But here it is in November, and I can declare that it's impossible for us to, to see a primary care provider because no one is taking new patients. No mm -hmm. one. Um, early, early this year, I reached out to Gifford, and I found out very quickly that there are no openings for, for a new patient like me. Uh, but I was invited to, to go on their wait list, and I was told it would be at least one year. Oh and, um, and so I thought, okay, I'll hang in there, right? <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, I decided to just check in with them and make sure that I was still on the list. They still had my correct phone number. They were very nice to me, but they let me know. Here's what they said. Yes, we've got you down. We aren't working from the waiting list yet. Oh my. Oh my is right. Mm. So I decided to probe a little, a little deeper. And uh, I wanted to let you know the inside scoop about Gifford. Um, the one year wait list to see a primary care provider is optimistic thinking. I was told it's more realistic to say the wait for a primary care provider is quote, indeterminate, an indeterminate amount of time. I was also told, quote, there's 100% certainty they won't be working from the wait list over the winter and through to the spring. So here I am. Uh, my husband and I, we need a medical home with a primary care provider sooner, not later. And um, I'm, I'm very concerned my primary care, basic primary care services we're talking about. And I saw on your sheet there about specialist and, and 45 days or whatever it is, yeah. but we're saying a year now mm -hmm. uh, and there's no guarantees on that. So the, the year, another year is optimistic thinking. Um, and so what I want, I want to believe, I look at the credentials from the people that are, are involved with this project. I'm really impressed with your credentials and the work experience that you have. I'm sure that you are a, a group of smart people. And I want to believe that you care about people like us and that you consider basic primary care services really important too. And I want to know what can I do to help you? to help you do something about making primary care services accessible to people like me in this part of Vermont. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Very, very important and very lacking in many areas. What we're trying to do, I, I think one of the things you could do to help, uh, to be candid, is we are desperately trying to get more people interested in providing medical care. Okay, as you're well aware, um, there is a desperate shortage of everything and certainly primary care people. So the, the short term solutions, unfortunately, are very few. Uh, we are looking at um, other groups that might be helpful in providing primary care services. So these might include not only the, the folks we would all think about, uh, advanced practice nurses and PAs, but in some ways, perhaps, uh, if we can find enough of them, uh, emergency medicine staff and some others. And I realize that um, none of these, perhaps, are as uh, skilled all around as primary care as a primary care physician, 
uh, although I would say I've been married for a number of years to a, a nurse practitioner who uh, does a good job. So understand the issue. Uh, we um, are looking at what alternatives we can get, but nothing uh, immediately on the horizon. There are uh, programs in the state uh, to um, provide tuition support uh, and, and other assistance to people who want to become physicians or nurses or uh, nurse practitioners, that sort of thing. So we're looking at those options um, and some others, but uh, unfortunately, just nothing in the immediate short term. May I add one other piece of information that might be helpful for you? Please, please. When, when you go to medicare.gov today, mm -hmm. you will find there's a list of 49 primary care providers within a radius of 15 miles okay. of, of my town here in Braintree. Vermont. And um, however, every single one of them, they're too busy taking care of patients and you can't even get to them. You can't even call them directly. Again, they're taking care of patients. I don't know if telemedicine is an option for us. I don't know anything, but right now we cannot get into healthcare and we're fully insured and we cannot find a primary care person who wants to take us on. And we're actually in pretty good health. We'd like to stay that way. <laughs> Right. No, thank you so much. No, thank you. I understand. I would say one of the things which has come up repeatedly uh, in conversation with the physicians and the other folk is that uh, they spend a, a good part of their day um, arguing with insurance companies on your behalf and doing a lot of other paperwork for other uh, other groups. And so one of the things that um, that should be able to be fixed uh, is part of that, right? I mean, if the people are, I'll make up a number, spending eight hours a day trying to take care of people and spending an hour or two or more uh, on the telephone or filling out paperwork. If we can reduce that, then obviously they could see more folk and that would be a much shorter term uh, solution. So. Uh, we will be working on those as well. I, I would just remind you, as I said, this process has a couple of months to go. And then some of those things will require uh, potentially legislative action to implement or regulation change. So uh, unfortunately, not a light switch, not a slam dunk, but, uh, but I think there may be some short-term options to um, let's say, lighten the load of the uh, people trying to provide care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hines. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm, uh, I am Jonathan Hines. I also live in Braintree, by the way. Uh, I haven't met my neighbors yet, but uh, I mean, I've been here a long time, but I haven't met my new neighbors. Uh, with the but anyway, I, uh, my issue is this, I have no problem with my medical providers at Gifford. I have gotten very excellent care with them. I also get special care at Dartmouth Hitchcock. No. My issue is also that I was summarily, uh, I have Part D, I have Medicare Part D. My, I am 70, my wife is 73, and we have, um, she does not have, uh, well, she just got Part D, which for some reason caused me to have been kicked off what I had in terms of insurance and on to a thing called Healthy Vermonters, which hmm. has not helped me. And, and I had two weeks. I, I did not get asked to put, be put on it. I was told I was now on it. I had two weeks to change over everything. And I found out that my script, my prescriptions costs will be in the neighborhood of $505 a month um, on the deductible. That's the deductible. And um, the uh, then there'll be a, a gap for a while. And then I'll have to get to $7,000 before I'm on catastrophic. And that'll probably be in November. 
So then I'll have a month. And it's going to go on. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be increased as of January 1st. I was placed on this November 1st. I just got some aspirin, <laughs> aspirin that the doctor prescribed, you know, which I don't need to get a prescription for, but they prescribed it and, and, and it's $12. Now that's not a big deal, right? 12 bucks. But when you add in all the other meds that I have to take, we're talking over $500 a month. I can't afford it. Yeah. And so when I go to my wonderful physicians, I will find out that uh, they will probably want a lab done. And that won't cost, you know, just a, a minor copay, not even 20%. It'll cost me an enormous amount of money. So I won't get the labs. I won't get the labs. I won't go for x-rays anymore. And uh, when my physicians ask me to do any other kind of uh, physical therapy or any other kind of um, other kinds of treatment, I won't do it now as a result of this, and I because I can't afford it. So uh, there's my situation. And um, anyway, it the, the system is, in my opinion, not only it, it's beyond broken; it's been torn apart and tried to be jury rigged to, to death and it just is not tenable for me or my wife so uh, i don't know what to say to you or tell you how to fix it but i can't live like this no. in the i can't get health care with the way it is right now um so the option is to not take my meds which will kill me and that's kind of a passive uh, approach to things, which it's inevitable anyway that I die. But I mean, I, I, I prefer not to be the re I prefer that lack of insurance was not the reason for me to, uh, have to die. So there, thanks. Yeah. Mr. Hines, Mr. Hammer, uh, can I, thank, can I jump thank in? you. Thank you for sharing that. Have you talk to the office of the health care advocate for the state oh yeah they they're the ones that ended up putting me on this thing that i don't want that i never oh, even I asked see. for okay all right thank you yeah understood mr martin mr mcmartin Okay. Ms. Puglisi, let's go to you while we're waiting for Mr. McMartin. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm really upset about all this. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I'm um, retired. Uh, I, I, I'm 78 years old. And uh, I've wanted to do something uh, to be helpful with all of this. And I'm uh, willing to help, but I did finally give up my license uh, two years ago and my certification. So I guess I would like to figure out how, how the, the state can make use of people like me who, um, who've had a lot of experience I've been a nurse practitioner since 1974, and uh, and I've uh, worked all over the the state, the medical centers in Vermont Hospital here at Gifford. Uh, I've worked everywhere, and um, but I haven't been made use of, and I'm willing to. And uh, but I have a great health care, so, you know. I, and I don't even pay anything for it. I, I have an MVP program. I have a managed care program and I, and I don't, I hardly pay anything for anything. So, so the, there, there are options out there. So I'm just surprised that this last gentleman got into this situation that he's in. So I don't know. 
Well, I, I wonder, I mean, certainly you have a great deal of experience and know Vermont very well. Have you um, chatted with any of, uh, I, I don't know if your area has a, um, I live well, in Randolph, right? a town right nurse or, a, or a, what in some areas would be called a parish nurse or one of the community advocates. I'm sure any of those could use your help. I know I'm just thinking about the, the first person that talked about not having a primary at all. And uh, it, it, it really frustrates me because I mean, I could certainly be helpful in, to a certain degree. You know, I'm not licensed anymore, but, uh, and I'm very active. I'm, you know, I'm, I can, you know, do it, you know, I'm very healthy. And so- well, I yeah, I, I would I would suspect that uh, even though you couldn't work in a in a clear clinical role, that there would be other things that you could be helpful doing that would offload some of the effort from the clinical folk to do more of what they do. Well, there's Let's no people for that, so that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking right. if the, the state, I think there are probably a few other people that are in the state that would be help that wouldn't mind doing some things and uh, answering questions, triaging, those kind of things. And right. so, Good uh, and I'm so I'm, and I'd certainly uh, be available to you guys in any fashion that I, you know, could be. So, um, please. Thank you. Me. No, thank you very much. And another good, another very good thought. And we have spoken with a number of uh, other uh, retired healthcare professionals who were, you know, also uh, helping in various ways to get to get uh, healthcare uh, make it available. Uh, Mr. McMartin, are you ready? I I think I am. Can you uh, hear sir. me? Yes, sir. Yeah, I I have a couple of I have a couple of questions. Who is Oliver Wyman, and and who do you get paid by? And uh, explain that to me, please. Yes, sir. Good, good questions. Uh, Oliver Wyman is a large uh, international consulting firm. We have a, a health and life science practice, which I'm part of. Uh, we do work with uh, hospitals and health systems. I've worked. Uh, around the country and in a few foreign countries to help people redesign their healthcare systems. Okay, can, can I ask you a question real Please. quick? What, what, what is your average uh, hourly rate for your services? I have no idea because we price well, it at on, project hold on, hold level. On, I'm sorry. On. Yep. Hold on. That's the same. I, I got to tell you. You, you call and you try to get like, what does this service cost? Yeah, well, you know, we don't really know. Yeah, it's, we it's, are an, ex sorry. No, it's just, it's very frustrating that you can't call somebody or, or get in touch with some website. You know, what the hell are you guys costing? What what is this particular service going to cost me? And it, I, it, you cannot get any of that information. Okay, it's the the contract that we have with the states uh, uh, posted. It's a public record. Oh, that's fine. I mean, that that's fine. But I go on there and I look at that. And I'm going to see a bunch of gobbledygook about. Okay, never. Let's let's move on from that. Okay, do you have a comment about uh, healthcare in the state or something? I, am, that I absolutely do. Yes. Okay. Um. I, I cannot get information on what certain procedures cost hmm. you know you call somebody and say okay what is a you know what is a mri cost 
Mm -hmm. Well, we can't tell you that. What does, um, it, what do certain procedures cost? And you cannot get a straight answer on, yeah, this is what it costs. Yes, sir. What's that? No, true. You're the the feds are requiring hospitals to do that. A number don't yet. Well, I, I and I and I get that, but but I went on to, for instance, um, I went on to find out what what a certain procedure would cost at Dartmouth. And I looked through the whole thing and I couldn't find exactly what it was that, that, that I was being recommended to have done. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. It, 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 it should be simpler than that. No, no I agreed. And it needs to be uh, more readily available so it's simpler to find. I mean, a, a rotator cuff, and this is what I'm talking about, rotator cuff surgery. What does that generally cost? Are, are you kidding me? You can't tell me that it's between 10000 and 15000 or it's between 15000 and 20000 Yeah. No, you're, you're correct. I mean, it, it should be available that way. Well, it's not. I know. I know. That's one of the things that that needs to be done. And it well, is. Hold on, uh, hold on. It needs to be done. Who who's going to who's going to make that happen? The feds, because well, they no, impose no, no, fines. No, no, no. Wait, well, no. hold on. Hold on. Hold on. We're in this community meeting. Yep. What the hell do you mean the feds are going to make that happen? No, it has to be local in Vermont. I I agree, but it is a federal requirement that it happen. And we can, you know, we can well, certainly you know suggest. What, you know what? I, I'm I'm sorry. I, I'm hearing this whole thing of well, it's the feds, it's 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 local, it's don't I okay, fine. The other thing that I that I want to talk about is Unnecessary testing. Are you still there? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I couldn't okay. quite understand. Okay, so so I, I, I have a rotator cuff. I went in. I had an MRI. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that was sent to Dartmouth. And I called them and said, okay, I want to come in and have a consult with the orthopedic surgeon. Okay, well, we have your MRI, but we need x-rays of your shoulder within 12 months. I said, hold on, you have my MRI I had an x-ray 13 months ago. Are you telling me that's not sufficient? No, it's not. We have to have it within 12 months. Okay. So long and short, I had another x-ray done. I go to my consult. They bring up the MRI. They talk to me about what I need to do. And I said, well, yeah, hold on. What what about what about my uh what, what about my uh x-rays? Well, we don't need your x-rays. He said, I said, hold on, what the hell do you mean? You don't need my x-rays. And they said, yeah, no, your MRIs, your MRIs tell us what we need to do. I guess what I'm saying here is. Excuse me, hold on a second. Yes, sir. I guess 
what I'm saying is, you're telling me that, you're telling me that somebody's telling me I have to have these x-rays, which I had done. And now I go to my appointment and they say, yeah, we don't need these. Hmm. And that probably cost the American taxpayers a thousand dollars. Yes, sir. What the hell is going on? I don't know, but it shouldn't. Well, I, I, I get that, but I'm not getting any, it shouldn't, it, you know, it shouldn't, it's it, the federal government, it's whatever. You know what? <laughs> I want to know what you guys are going to do for us. Well, I, I have to be honest. If there's something that involves an individual physician or group's practice, there's not anything that we can do. Well, hold on, hold on. When I went in for my review for my, my rotator cuff, he brought up the MRI and I said, hold on, no, you need to bring up the, the, the x-rays. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that, that <laughs> as a medical community, we can't say, you know, MRIs trump x-rays. Are you really telling me that? No, sir. What, what I'm saying to you is, I mean, certainly the medical society and the medical staff of that hospital would be able to um, oversee um, the physician or the physician's work as to whether it's appropriate and so forth. But as a matter of state regulation, right, and to tell somebody, you know, if you tell your assistant or someone, well, in order for a person to be seen for a shoulder problem, they need this or that, that's not something a regulator can do. That, that's all I'm saying. I, I, well, not, and, and, and I, I understand that, but why the hell can't a regulator say that? Say, you know what? No. And the other thing is, I, I forgot to mention this. I had x-rays last August, and I went in in September. You tell me that an x-ray that's 13 months old is not as good as an x-ray that's 12 months old. Tell me how that works. I, sir, I can't accept that my orthopedist tells me the same thing when I go to see him. So it's not just your orthopedist. Well, I, and I get that, but I got to tell you, they didn't even look at my x-rays. I had to tell them to bring my x-rays up. And yes, quite, quite frankly, that's bullshit. Yes, sir, I hear you. Okay, good enough. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you very much. Ms. Hartman. Thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Hartman, and I have lived in Randolph for 22 years. My primary care physician is Dr. Laura Barber, who is at the Chelsea Clinic. And I choose to drive from Randolph to Chelsea because um, she is such an outstanding doctor and, and she's one of the best primary care physicians I have ever had. And she has been fired by Gifford because she does not see enough patients. And she sees every patient who walks in the door and they get, they get appointments within 24, 48 hours, uh, of their request for an appointment. And they say, well, you're not seeing enough patients. You're not earning your keep, so to speak, at the clinic. And there comes a time in a rural community like Chelsea that you have to pay for your doctors. The, the hospital, the community, somebody 
has to just suck it up and pay because the community needs one doctor. And she has an excellent reputation. Her, reputation, her, pa her patients love her. She's got an excellent, warm, welcoming staff. And we are crushed to lose her next month and we don't know what we're going to do. And I think that is just appalling. Thank you. No, thank you. Appreciate the point. Others, other comments or experiences? Yeah, how do I get on here? Yes, sir, Mr. Mack. Yeah, I want to second that comment about Dr. Barber. Um, that that clinic was started by Dr. Martin years and years ago mm. when the government gave him some tu uh, tuition support, the governor, who was also from Chelsea. And now uh, Gifford's taken that over some time ago, and Dr. Barber is, is uh, just about the only GP or, in, in quite a ways around. Uh, I depend on her. Um, I'm 73, if that makes any difference. Uh, and, and I'm really sorry to see that in a place where they're short of, G, of general practitioners that they're letting somebody go on December 18th with a 90 day notice. And I don't know if there's anything that can be done about it, but there really should be something done about that. And that something could happen immediately or short term. Um, I don't understand how the bean collars as they are, uh, can justify let, letting off uh, the only GP in the immediate surrounding area in a very rural area, um, especially when they've taken over that clinic from someone else who kept that thing alive, no matter who, how many people were seeing it. Uh, that's all I have to say. I'm sorry, right, sir. I go. I wish they could change it. Right, thank you, uh, Mr. Gardner. Hi, uh, it's Randy Garner from Randolph, former board member and uh, local funeral director. And um, my my concern is, uh, as we talk about how to change health care, I, I want to support them not reducing specialist services in, in Randolph. Um, anecdotally, sending people 30 or 40 miles away, they just don't get it done, particularly in the winter. Um, particularly the elderly just will not hit the freeway and go 30 or 40 miles. And so they defer it until spring or until they can. And then by then we now have a price tag for that same thing that is now exacerbated and, and gone bad. Um, and those um, specialty people also back up the emergency room. I know of a lady uh, who just recently had her life saved in the Gifford emergency room. Um, the local OBGYN was able to get in there and do an emergency procedure, had to do it in the ER. It was so urgent to stop her from hemorrhaging to death. She would have died in her car or in the back of an ambulance trying to get to Dartmouth. So if there's, I just think it's, they have to look really carefully at, at reducing um, not reducing services and just trying to cherry pick what's what's available at, at Gifford. Um, I think you need the whole thing. And I, and I understand everybody's having problems with costs, but that's the real issue because if you ship all these people somewhere else, then we're gonna look at increased waiting times or also employees, if the local employees, Gifford's our largest employer, in in the town um if they most randolph people when they need to get something done seem to head south to dartmouth hmm. so now those jobs and possibly residences are now in new hampshire making things even worse for vermont it understandably it's a catch-22 but um i'm just hoping that they don't take the simple approach of saying, well, we just need to centralize all these specialized services. I think that would be a huge mistake. No, th thank you for the comment. I, I think really the only centralization that's possible, let's say, are for the really high end things. And they're, they're pretty much centralized, right? If you think about heart surgery or brain surgery, because those are things that require expensive equipment, 
a lot of people who really know how to run them, big teams and and require a big population to uh, to serve. So, but certainly to to get to an orthopedist or an ENT person and, and those sorts of things, they need to be um, much more generally available. So, absolutely understand that. Yeah, and that's they are now. I mean, that's the way it is working now. I just want to express support for Gifford that it stay that way. Right. No, I'm, I'm, the, the big stuff's going to Dartmouth or UVM now, anyway. But the but um, but we have a lot of really excellent specialists here, and like I say, I, being the local funeral director, I can tell you and anecdotally, deferred treatment is a real problem. I hear a lot of stories about this, and and uh, you know, decentralizing and sending people people long distances, I think, is just a big problem. Yeah, and as certainly a lot of people don't have cars, and getting somewhere if they're trying, if they're also working, is also a real problem. Exactly. Thank you. I, I guess a question, since since you uh, you know the area very well, uh, transportation, uh, how is that handled for folks that live way out in the in the country or don't have a car? Is that available? Transportation to Gifford or to to, to Gif? Well, let's start with Gifford. I mean, just getting from the house to to the nearest clinic or to Gifford? Um, we do have, we have a local, local transportation system that uh, people can call, uh, even for specialized appointments, it's very responsive. I do not know about the other valleys like Chelsea and Rochester, for example, um, but the odds of them getting to Gifford are substantially higher than they would be if they were forced to go to Dartmouth. I mean, if you know anything about Vermont or New yeah. England in general, east-west is pretty, north-south is pretty easy, east-west is yeah. pretty complicated. Yeah, I, I live in central Massachusetts in the mountains about 150 miles away from you. Yeah. So exactly. get, up, get up that way. Uh, reasonably frequently it's lovely country but uh and you've got worse roads than i do yeah but people are very helpful around here too we, there is a extensive volunteer network of people who get people to appointments and you know that's the advantage of a small community so i i think our transportation really people should not be going without treatment because they can't get a ride right no, uh, no, un understood. And I also been given to understand by talking to the hospital folk that, uh, you know, getting a um, an ambulance to to get people from Gifford to almost anywhere else is a very difficult issue as well. So th thank you for those comments, Mr. Gardner. Appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Tardif. Um, I just had a little bit to add to your question about how transportation affects things. Um, I and my family are patients at the Chelsea Clinic, and I went to the Gifford listening conversation last month to hear what was going on as far as the, the community services were concerned. And one of the things that came up um, was that people who have trouble getting to their appointments have relied on our local transportation's uh, volunteers, which has basically evaporated over the last few years. And there were actually a couple of the nurses from the Chelsea Clinic at that one saying that it was a real problem, that they were having people cancel their appointments at the last moment because they couldn't get a ride. And the transportation representative said, we recognize this is a problem, but four years ago, we had 44 volunteers, I believe, and now we have 16. And you know, nobody really has an answer for that. But on the other hand, we have people that need to get to the doctor and they can't get there. And also you have the clinic having spaces set out for people and then they can't give it to someone else it, it's a real problem yes, and if i could also say that i and my family 
are very concerned about continuity of care, given that Dr. Laura Barber is going to be leaving. Um, we need a primary care physician. I've spent over eight months trying to get a billing issue with Dartmouth, Dartmouth resolved because by accident, a referral went out under the, the signature of Rebecca Savage, who is the PA. Fine, fine provider, but she can't do an acceptable referral for Blue Cross. Hmm. And so I went back and forth and back and forth trying to get it reprocessed. And, you know, it was like $700 difference between having an MD signature and not having an MD signature on it. Mm. I'm, and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And we have heard nothing from Gifford. Isn't there some kind of a legal, a legal requirement for talking to patients about continuity of care? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Other other experiences or comments. Hello. Yes, yes, Ms. Davis. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know where the hand is, so I've That's been okay. to figure that out. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Listen, I, you know, it's it's so sad to listen to everybody's stories, but I must say, I I have a very different story about Gifford, and I have been absolutely pleased with my work uh, that has been done over there. I um I was diagnosed with a lump in my breast and went through having, you know, uh, found out that it was surgery and went, or I mean, uh, cancer and went through the surgery and all that. I had complications, which was amazing to me that the staff and the doctor and the whole hospital were there 24 seven for me. It was the best care I had ever received. And um, I must say the only hiccup I had was is finding out that my Blue Cross Blue Shield only covered my doctor um, that was my oncologist in one location and not on the place where she was actually loaned to, which is up in Berlin. And um, so that was a little complicated. And I found that even now the new oncologist, uh, I think that Blue Cross Blue Shield needs to get with it with as far as if a doctor is uh, practicing at one or two facilities, they should be covered at whatever facility they are because the problem is is that if it isn't taken care of then it falls on the patient mm -hmm. and um but my experience with gifford has been phenomenal and i love it it's 20 25 minutes from my house well actually 30 um but it's nice to have such a wonderful facility so close and to have everybody so caring um, I had a hip replacement done there two years ago, and then I dealt with the surgery with the cancer this year. I just can't speak any better about the place. I think we need small hospitals like this, and there are too many people that can't travel over to Dartmouth, you know, or up to Burlington or Berlin. So we need these small hospitals like Gifford and Escutney. Um, and I, I just think that my experience was so nice. The staff treated me like family. We were all a team and they listened to me. I listened to them and it was a well-oiled machine. I can't say enough about it. So that's my experience. And I, and I do know that we have a very crazy, crazy health system in this, this country. Um, but I do think that we also need to focus in on our little hospitals and and our little clinics because they're really needed and we just don't want to see what happened down south happen here. So that's all I have to say. Um, thank you for doing your work and I really appreciate all of this. 
Well, thank you for the information. I, I have to find out more about the Blue Cross thing with not uh, considering the physician. I guess it's in network if they're in a different place. Well, that's that's exactly it. If if I had seen Carmen, who is my oncologist up in Berlin, where she was actually on loan, she would have been out of network, but she was in network at Gifford. The new okay. oncologist that came on is covered in Burlington and Berlin, but not at Gifford. Okay. And that's a Blue Cross, Blue, Blue Shield situation, I right. think. Um, right. So the, anyways, I, I won't take up any more of your time. Thank no. you. I appreciate it. No, no, very helpful. Uh, Mr. Chase, have you been trying to say something? Okay. Um, I, I didn't yep. raise my hand, but uh, I, I'm Derek Chase. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Yes, uh, sir. Yeah, I, uh, nice to see you again, Dr. Harmony. Um, so uh, I grew up in central Vermont. I, I babysat for one of the Gifford ER doctors. Uh, I attended UVM Medical School. I'm a Freeman Fa uh, Foundation scholar and made a commitment to practice in Vermont. Um, I was employed at Gifford for, for five years, and I uh, continued my privileges. Um, I, I have a comments as a provider that I'll address tomorrow. Um, but as a patient, I'm also a patient there. Uh, and I have family members who are a patient there. Um, and one of my big problems is the lack of orthopedic uh, call uh, availability on call. Um, mm -hmm. We have zero orthopedic uh, call. Um, so hip fractures are getting transferred. Um, uh, people who run their hands through table saws don't have care. Uh, kids uh, who fall off trampolines uh, don't have surgical care. Um, we, have, we, have, uh, we have four um, orthopedic providers on staff and the, the administration is, is not working cooperatively with us to provide this care. And, and so that's a big issue. I think um, as a critical access hospital, we need to provide critical access uh, to to common services, including orthopedic care. So that that's something I'd like to see done. Um, and uh, you know, another big problem which a lot of people have mentioned is um, the lack of a provider continuity of care. Um, and there's a lot of uh, provider turnover, which is also a problem. And then uh, lastly, speaking to price transparency. I think that's also very important. Um, and CMS and Vermont Act 53 mandate that hospitals post um, uh, their prices online. Mm -hmm. uh, and Gifford is one of only two hospitals in the state that has not been compliant with that. Mm -hmm. So I think that is extremely important. Um, you know, currently their, their charge master is dated October 2022. Um, so, so again, those are all things that I think could be improved upon uh, from a, um, a, a patient standpoint. Thank you, sir. Other uh, comments, experiences? Uh, Mr. Spahn? Hi, I'm Arnie Spahn. Uh, I live up here in uh, Strode Independent Living, which uh, Gifford built six years ago and uh, me and my wife have been very very happy with the with the lodgings here and more than happy with our care at uh, Gifford I wanted uh second Terry's uh comments on uh on what goes on down at Gifford as far as the patients go uh, as far as the uh problems that we have in the state uh for medical care uh it seems to be nationwide. It seems that uh, there are not enough people going into uh, medicine in any of the specialties, uh, well, especially in primary care uh, or in nursing. Uh, and I, <clears throat> I just have to assume that uh, uh, the reasons for that are uh, uh, inadequate compensation. And to a certain extent, there's no place to live uh, uh, to move into up here in, uh, in Randolph or elsewhere in Vermont. We have a dire housing shortage. So those are some of the problems that uh, face uh, Gifford and the rest of the uh, system. And I would 
uh, I would certainly hope that uh, the the Green Mountain Care Board uh, pay attention to those problems and uh, uh, work with other people to solve them. Thank you very much for pointing that out. Uh, hearing the same same issues around the state, very much. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, yeah, Bridget. Hi, my name is Bridget Mee and Brees. I'm a nurse practitioner in Rochester, Vermont, actually with Gifford. Um, and I just wanted to comment and say that I think at a provider perspective, and I know the provider meeting is tomorrow, but unfortunately I can't attend. Um, one of the things that really helps patients that I work with is being able to have a community at Gifford that um, I can rely on and refer my patients to. Um, if I have a patient who has a cardiac need and I can use our cardiac specialist, I know that that patient will be seen. Um, conversely, if I have a patient who's seen by an excellent physician at Dartmouth, they might not be able to be seen by that excellent physician at Dartmouth for a month or two, even if they have an acute issue. Um, yeah. And so I do think that having smart specialty care is really important, particularly in our most rural communities. And Rochester is a very, very rural community where transportation really is an issue. And for a lot of my patients, for economic issues, for all sorts of issues, getting to Dartmouth is really a tremendous burden. Um, and so having robust rural healthcare systems is absolutely imperative. And I see better outcomes for my patients when I can right. use providers in my system. Right, thank you. Have you found, uh, or have you been able to use any of the uh, telehealth access to, to get somebody uh, on the line in less than a month? Um, so I have reached out directly to clinics where I have patients who are established to try to get care. And particularly recently, I've had enormous challenges um, in terms of getting them care quickly when they need care quickly. And what, what have been, uh, do you know the reasons for some of that? Um, I've heard that um, some of the organizations don't have acute emergency visits that are even available until December. Okay. All right. So, and very... so I've been asked to manage those patients in primary care until they can be seen by specialties. Okay. When they, they really do need to be seen by a specialty. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Ms. Puglisi? Hi. Um, I guess uh, in summary from all of this that I've heard today, uh, we need more, more providers. We need pro pro uh, providers not to be uh, denied access to uh, facilities. And 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 I'm you know I'm I am upset that some for some reason Gifford seems to be reducing its its uh, providers. Um, so I, I think the the Green Mountain Care Board can do something about that. And and what I've also heard is people. Uh, are probably underinsured or chose the wrong insurance company, and I'm and I'm seeing that uh, oh, we need sure. cost. We need cost. Uh, Gifford needs to get in line with uh, providing or having an easier access to cost. I will mention one thing: if you have insurance, then you need to talk to your insurance providers about. Uh, uh, procedures that you might need, uh, and and what what your cost will that. be after. So so that's that's kind of uh, where I see what we've been hearing, and and, it, and Gifford overall, uh, people are really pretty happy with it, but I'm I'm noticing that there's a lot of turnover there, people leaving. My my primary may be leaving as well, so I'm mm. I'm going to be a little upset about that. But do you, uh, uh, do you know why? I think it's the same uh, same uh, reason that uh, uh, the Chelsea provider is is being let go. I think I think uh, in our in our uh, uh, bottom line culture of medicine, we've got visits that are too short, 
and providers can't do everything that they want to do. And so they they may be seeing fewer patients or they may not. I'm not sure about that. But I think it's I think it's always going to be the bottom line that that um, hospital administrators talk about, you know, and are looking at. And so I think that's where we need to we need to um, talk to the hospitals and and make sure the primary people are there and um, make sure that people are seen in a, an appropriate time and. Maybe there could be uh, uh, some other kind of, like I was talking about me and, and, and triaging people, maybe there needs to be some triage people that can answer questions that may be simple enough uh, in terms of not needing a, you know, a prescription or, or even an exam uh, to, to not to make, to make better use of time, of the time that people have. Thank you. That you and I, I think, are getting the same notes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. and Ms. Kennedy. Bonnie and Neil. Okay, let, let's go to Michael. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. and Ms. Kennedy. You can hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. This is in regard to the Chelsea Health Center which has been there for probably 60 years, uh, was started by ex-governor Stanley Wilson. He was instrumental. He hired two UVM graduate students to start the health center. The health center has served the people of Chelsea, Tunbridge, Verschia, Washington. Since then, none of these towns have a doctor except for Chelsea. A large percentage of the residents here are elderly and depend on the health center to meet their needs. We have learned that Dr. Laura Barber has been terminated as of mid-December. It does not appear that she is going to be replaced. Not to take anything away from nurses, physicians, assistants, LNAs, the people of our community need local access to a doctor. They are not in a position to travel to Barrie or Randolph. It will be very different or difficult for all of us to find a doctor who will accept new patients. Those who can will most likely travel to Barry and become patients of Central Vermont mm -hmm. Network, no longer patients of Gifford. Dr. Barber is respected and liked by her patients. She is knowledgeable, kind, and helpful in all situations. When she was advised of her termination, she asked if there was another spot for her and was told, there is no place for you at Gifford. And mm -hmm. here we are, no one can find a new doctor. She does not deserve to be treated this way, and our residents are terribly upset by Gifford's treatment of her. She never hurries you out the door, and she answers your questions in such a way that you feel you have been treated with concern and respect. I would like them to please reconsider this action. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Appreciate it. Mr. Koshier, Michael. Hi, uh, yes, my name is Michael Kershier. Um, I'm a patient and an employee of Gifford Medical Center. Um, happen to work in the accounting department. So with regards to the bean cutters doing the cuts, cutting the costs, <laughs> um, that's not always the case. Our budgets are approved by Green Mountain Care Board. And like a, every hospital in Vermont, uh, the increases we may need aren't approved. So we have to live with what we got. Um, so just a note on that, there's been a lot of calls about that. Secondly, as a patient, I've been very happy with the services here, and I'd hate to see any of them go. And I understand Chelsea's losing their primary care. I don't know if everyone knows the reason or not. I don't know the reason. But I know we are trying to provide the best quality care to all areas we service. And sometimes doctors leave or there's reasons that we don't understand or know why. But we are trying to make that work. And I know I've my own primary care is also leaving as well. So it's not like I'm exempt from the same issues the community has, but I know also that Gifford is making all the efforts they can to find people. And it's just so expensive because we're ending up having to hire contract employees that are twice or three times the cost minimum as a regular employee. And that could be for 
physicians or nurses or whatsoever. And that adds an extraordinary cost to the bottom line. So yes, you know, we are budget driven, but at the same time, we have to generate enough revenue to cover our costs. Otherwise we can't keep our doors open. And that's what we're trying to do. And it's not about patient quality care because I know talking with people here, working with these people, being a patient, quality is their primary goal and will continue to be their primary goal. I just want to make sure that the services that are being offered aren't reduced by Green Mountain Care Board. And, you know, hopefully going forward, maybe the budgets can be increased a little bit because um, we're at the mercy of the insurance companies, what we get paid. So, you know, the shorter visits and all these other things. Yeah, we're a critical care hospital, but, you know, we're still under a contract with these insurance payers and they dictate how much time we can spend for certain services in many cases. And, um, you know, it's not that the doctors don't want to spend more time. It's just we're not getting paid for it. And we it's just really unfortunate uh, circumstances where we are in the healthcare. It is a. a not a great system that we have now because as we've heard already you know one person may have a great insurance plan the other person doesn't more out-of-pocket exp pocket expenses less out-of-pocket expenses there's no universal plan right now and it makes it hard to provide care when you have to deal with so many different insurance plans that have so many different options and still provide the same great care to the community that's, that's, that's all I have for comments. I just appreciate your time and uh, the feedback you're collecting. And hopefully people understand it's not the bean counters necessarily that are causing the problems. Um, we're a heavily regulated industry and it's not just Green Mountain Care Board we have to answer to, but Medicare, Medicaid, and uh, many other countless provide payers. So uh, thanks again. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the uh, the explanation. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, are there other uh, comments, observations, experiences, please? Is there anyone on the telephone who would like to make a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, Dr. Chase. Mm -hmm. No, this is actually, um, this is actually Dr. Fazone. I, um, was formerly, uh, an anesthesiologist at Gifford. I was very happy, uh, and proud to be a member of the medical community there for a number of years. Um, and I would say in the last five years, Hello. the culture of that institution changed. I'm on, I'm on um, that call right now, the video. That's why I yeah. the call. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, or, yes, sir. There was a little background for a minute, but go ahead. So, so that's that's probably something that can be addressed at another time. But my question: um, the anesthesia group there was replaced with a contracted group from North Carolina. And uh -huh. the billing that the anesthesia department did was um, assumed by that group and they took those proceeds. They also took a stipend for providing services. And I was told by Dan Bennett that that was gonna be less expensive for the hospital than continuing to pay the group of stable providers who'd been there for a number of years, I found that very hard to believe. And, um, and I also think I would want the Green Mountain Care Board to explore whether that loss of billing diminishes Gifford's ability to uh, negotiate uh, with insurance companies. Okay. Um, I can only imagine it, it does. And also, all I could see in that act, I, I um, did my residency at the University of Vermont, and I very much wanted to practice in Vermont, and I liked the sense of community, and that's what brought me back here. And 
um, to see a small community hospital like Gifford go to this big corporation and say, provide our anesthesia services, I was very disappointed with that decision. And I, I'm convinced it makes no economic sense. Um, I noticed that they are, there is currently a, an ad out and um, it is for a, a CRNA and, um, and the amount of money that they're offering is quite close. I, I believe it's actually, it's, it's quite close to what I was earning when I worked there. And so they're billing this thing as a cost savings because they, they're hiring um, practitioners, you know, uh, CRNAs and, 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 and look, I mean, I, I think nurse anesthetists are wonderful. I'm not saying anything, you know, that, that they don't do a wonderful job. I'm just saying, I don't think there's any cost savings going on here. Uh, I think there's a lot of money that's going out. And I can also tell you that if, when I first arrived at Gifford, uh, Dr. Di Nicola was the chief medical officer and he treated the physicians with a lot of respect. And Dr. Ciccarelli was the chief uh, of surgery. And again, I felt valued under those individuals. The individuals in those positions now, they've run out more doctors than you can imagine. And I, I mean, I spoke with a hospitalist at the hospital that I'm currently at, and I will tell you, I received, you know, a small award for my services at the current hospital, not just from my, you know, uh, program director. But I'm just saying, I, I, I feel very valued where I am, and at that place. It was, it had just, there's been a real deterioration. I think the leadership there has to be looked at. That's all I'm, I'm going to say about that. And I also think this decision to bring in a corporation to run the anesthesia department should be examined as well. I mean, they, they, they decided to move to an electronic medical record. And that sounds great, right? Everybody loves, you know, a computerized system. This thing doesn't chart vitals. It doesn't and it was brought by the company, again, by this corporation. And it was just a way of extracting more money out of Gifford. Um, we had paper records that were more than adequate. And if we were going to, you know, if the plan was to go to an electronic medical record, then it should have been, uh, it should have been done in a different manner because the, the entire anesthesia department at the time said, this thing's horrible. So anyway, I'm probably going on too much, but I, I would ask the Green Mountain Care Board to look at that decision closely. And I heard the way it was billed in the last meeting and half the things they said just weren't so. So that's just something to look at. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the comment. Are there other uh, comments or experiences? Oh, yes, ma'am, Ms. Tardif. Ann Tardif? Uh, Anne, you have a hand up. Do you wish to speak? Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry about that. Um, if, if no one else has something important, I have a couple of follow-up comments. That'd be um, great, thank I you. Think I, I think I mentioned that I had been to a meeting with um, Clara Martin and Gifford and the Valley Transit last month in Chelsea. And one of the things that the Gifford representative was talking about was that they had basically spent the last year 
uh, bringing up to speed a new EMR system. Now, there have been multiple EMR systems over the last few years, mm -hmm. but this was supposed to solve all the problems. Well, my husband had an appointment on Monday and there were none of his records available. He had to tell them all of his medications, you know, all of, all of the background and everything like that. So the year that they spent acquiring and getting up this new EMR system does not seem to have been well spent. Um, the other thing is I'm hearing other people saying that their PCPs may be leaving also. And people talking about a lot of turnover mm -hmm. and the difficulty in retaining staff. And also it's really expensive to buy contract staff to cover shortages. Right. If that's the case, why are they eliminating a stable long-term PCP from their system who wants to continue to practice in the area, who likes practicing in a small rural area? That's all, thank you very much. Well, thank you, I appreciate the comment. <clears throat> Other comments, experiences, please. Uh, Mr. Crochet again. Hi, just to follow up on the previous caller's um, thing, the EM, new EMR system we're going on here is Meditech, and we just went live October 9th. So, um, yeah, everything wasn't in, but it's not like we've been on this for a long time. We just went live, so it's going to take a few months to iron out the kinks, and that's the case no matter what EMR system you go with. It just, it's a its a large, complicated system, a lot of uh, inner workings, and it's gonna have a lot better interfaces once it's all settled than what our old system did. So I just, I was just a follow up on that little caller. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, experiences? Mr. Mack. Yeah, uh, just back to that same thing I was talking about before. What ability do you have in, in what you are doing here to uh, lobby or uh, advise or in any way twist the arms down and give her to uh, revisit uh, the Dr. Barber situation or any of the PCPs that you're losing? Well, I think in terms of the local situation with an individual, uh, not not much, right? We're we've been aimed at um, the I don't know if they're the larger issues, but let's say the overriding issues of trying to look at getting uh, healthcare services, including primary care, but the services into the community in an appropriate way, in a way that keeps the hospital uh, solvent and going. And what uh, changes in uh, payment, policy, uh, regulation, uh, recruitment, the things that the, uh, the state, the Green Mountain Care Board have um, uh, some authority or perhaps some ability to accomplish. But in terms of the, the interior workings of a hospital, uh, not not anything that we're going to do or be able to do. Do the administrators of that hospital uh, are they listening into these conversations? Are they hearing us? Or uh, uh, no, I expect I, ex I expect they're hearing you, and uh, and I know that they they have others have been listening in. Uh, the and the hospital board uh, has also a. a I, well, I don't know about this situation, but we are speaking with all the hospital, the boards of all each of the hospitals as well, and I expect some of them would be listening into this session as well. I think the lady had a good point earlier when she said, "I live in Washington, so my choice is go north or go south." Yes, sir. Chelsea, seven miles from me, Barry's a little farther. Uh, but if they're going to box me out of Chelsea, I'm not going to Gifford. That's too far. I go there when I, when when they uh, send me to see a specialist or whatever. But uh, 
to go there for you know GP services, that's that's not going to work. They're going to lose a patient, as they will quite a few others, and that has to have a, some kind of financial uh, um, impact on them as well. Yes, sir. I think. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, okay. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Other um, other comments, experiences. See if we have. Yes, there's a comment uh, in the chat about um, about cost of living, inflation, and housing. I mean, certainly we've been hearing in every part of the state that those are all issues in finding affordable housing for anyone, whether someone currently in the state without a home or trying to recruit is a problem. We did speak uh, to a hospital earlier today or to a group that said they had been able to recruit physicians and some nurses, but that they had come into the area, spent a few months in rental housing or in a hotel, and then they'd left. So again, housing, uh, as was pointed out in the chat, was an issue. Uh, any other comments, uh, experiences to share or um, or questions? Anyone on the telephone that would care to make comment? Ah, oh, yes, Ms. Terry. Yeah, I just I I'm under the um the the final sentence on your main um, final slide. Next steps we will summarize yes. the things that we have learned and use it to come up with solutions. Is there a way that we uh, that we're listening tonight can follow up on? your results? Oh, yes. I mentioned at the start, and I, I apologize if, uh, if I wasn't clear, we will take all the, all the information you're giving us. And, you know, we've done uh, roughly 100 of meetings, not with large groups all, but with a number of different uh, groups and folks around the state, have another 50 to go. We'll take the comments plus information from the state, data from here and there, um, and formulate these options. They'll be analyzed over the winter. We'll uh, relook at them based on what those, uh, those effects are, both on the hospital and on the health of the community. And then we're gonna come up <clears throat> to your area uh, in late winter my, or early spring. My guess is probably March um in person and i and some folk on my team will meet with the hospital board and leadership and then after that we'll have a meeting a, a t in my part of massachusetts it's a town meeting uh, where the community can gather we'll present what we think the options are we'll get your reaction your advice your input on that and, and from the hospital. And then we'll go back, relook at those options, reconfigure them perhaps. And, uh, and then that will be the report that gets delivered to the Green Mountain Board, a uh, care board and to the legislature. And so then, there, there will be more follow-up. I'm how sorry? How do we access that? Then how will we access that, that report? Well, uh, we're gonna deliver it to you in person. And then it'll be posted on the Green Mountain website, I'm sure. That's that's their method for doing that. But okay. you can you can continue. We'll give you in a minute a way to continue to give us your input. And then at the time we give the report, of course, there'll be public comment and uh, you know other ways to to affect that. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. We're, we're trying to give people a lot of opportunity to comment on this and to, to influence what happens. But I think the, the goal of it is to improve healthcare service in the community.
any other comments or uh, questions? If not, we'll. Um... Yes, ma'am. Bridget? I, I just have one more comment. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that um, one of my observations is how important seeing an actual healthcare provider is to people. Right. And so I've, I've heard a couple people make comments about um, telehealth, which is valuable. But one of the things that I think that is so valuable about Gifford is that we do have providers available to meet with patients. And again, in specialties in primary care, I know people have had some frustrations getting in, but when we can get people in, um, they really have a better outcome just having that personal relationship with their providers. Right. No, I, well made, and, and I agree with you. I, you know, but I think if, if we can't get somebody there in person, at least being able to get their advice uh, rapidly would be uh, uh, required. Thank you. Any other comments or uh, suggestions? Okay, um, Gretchen, let's go to the last slide, please. So uh, this is how you can continue to give us your experience, advice, and, uh, and concerns. If you will go to this uh, website, the Green Mountain Care Board's website, it's on this gmcboard.vermont.gov, then you have a, a selection to make, or you can, which will get you to Act 167 community meetings, or you can enter this whole thing, uh, gmcboard.vermont.gov backslash act dash 167 dash community dash meetings and put a uh, write a comment and you can either attach your name or not they'll be posted we do monitor this we collect all these comments we take them into consideration along with the things you've said tonight and others are are telling us as we try to formulate these uh options and possibilities but just to remind you the process uh, will take another few months uh, many of these things will require uh, action either by the care board or by the legislature uh, so unfortunately there are not any um, extremely short-term fixes here so with that are there any final comments or any public comments that anyone would care to make. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I do apologize for being late. I was having more of my technical difficulties than usual, but I apologize for that. I thank you for taking time out of your afternoon and evening and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you.